I think we should start now. Uh, thank you all for coming, dear colleagues, our interns from Global Encounters Program, guests, and we have people joining us uh, on Zoom. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, for those of you who don't know much about um, UCA and uh, the Cultural Heritage and Humanities Unit, I just would like to say a few words about it. So uh, this lecture is being organized by the Cultural Heritage and Humanities Unit of the Graduate School of Development. And um, this unit was established uh, officially in 2013 to advance uh, UCA's mission on cultural heritage preservation. So we do all kinds of work and activities, um, starting with our publication series, uh, book series on cultural heritage of Central Asia, research paper series, and recently we initiated another interesting um, series called Cultural Production, where we engage um, with cultural heritage in a creative way using multimedia um, tools and technology. So um, you can access all our publications on UCA uh, website and the CHHU section. And we also organize um, periodically um, public lectures. So we invite both um, regional scholars, uh, local scholars from uh, Bishkek, uh, and also international scholars and researchers who conduct research on and in Central, Central Asia. So one of them, um, to, uh, this, this year, recently this summer, we are lucky to have a group of interns uh, uh, through the Global Encounters program, and they are very young and, you know, enthusiastic, talented group of people, and uh, my unit, uh, CHHU, Sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I am Elmira Kochumkulova. I am the head of the uh, Cultural Heritage and Humanities Unit. So uh, we are very pleased to have um, Mr. Mohammed Basharat, uh, who is an MA student uh, at the Institute of um, uh, Muslim Civilizations. Um, yeah, for the study of Muslim civilizations in, uh, of AKU in London. And before that, he uh, completed um, uh, Foreman Christian College in Lahore with honors. And he is uh, very um, um, interested uh, in history, geopolitics, culture, and people of mountain communities of Central Asia. But he's focusing his research in his uh, home region uh, in Hunza. So for those of us who know very little about Pakistan, I think this will be very uh, interesting lecture, including myself. Uh, last summer, uh, two of my colleagues from my unit, uh, they had a chance to travel to northern regions of Pakistan under a different um, and, um, project called uh, um, Silk, uh, Resilient Silk Road Network, where we um, travel to, to those mountain regions of Central Asia, including Pakistan, to learn about um, uh, the state of cultural heritage preservation and how cultural practitioners, researchers, and institutions are working together to um, preserve and promote their rich and diverse cultural traditions and heritages. So, and they were really, really, you know, um, um, amazed by the beautiful, you know, the, the nature and the mountains. The mountains look so different from the mountains in Central Asia. So. Uh, they were quite, you know, um, returned with full of impressions and good feelings about the people, its rich culture. So I hope that in, in the future, uh, we can have more such interactions between these um, mountain communities and researchers. So, and Basharat, uh, Mr. Basharat will tell about his uh, topic today. So um, we look forward uh, to gain uh, new information, knowledge about this very interesting, complex geopolitical uh, history of this uh, region. So we will have for about 30 minutes uh, Basharat speaking, and uh, we will leave the questions to the end of the lecture. Unless there is an urgent question that you need to clarify, so you can raise your hand and ask the question. Otherwise, uh, let's leave the questions to the end. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Almira, for uh, giving an introduction. Uh, as you all know, my name is uh, Mohammed Basharat and I'm from the northern areas of Pakistan, specifically from uh, Hunza district. Uh, my lecture today, the topic of my lecture basically is about the history of governance in Hunza and it's mostly about the internal governance uh, of Hunza. But with that, I would try to uh, 
give an introduction about Hunza, about its people, about its geography, and uh, try to relate it with the with the Central Asian region because many uh, many things in Hunza are related to Central Asia. So uh, let's begin. So basically, this is an overview. Uh, I'll be discussing a background, then we'll uh, move on to the main question. Um, and then we'll have a bit, I, I would say more of discussion than a lecture. And uh, then we can conclude. So uh, this is the Central Asian region. And uh, we can see that this is Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, the Central Asia, and then you can see China here and Iran. So Hunza lies somewhere here. It lies in the uh, Gilgit Baltistan region of Pakistan, which is the northern areas previously called northern areas, and it shares border with Afghanistan. And then the, through the Wakhan corridor, it's you can enter Tajikistan. And then you see the Kyrgyzstan lying here. So it's not a lot of distance, I would say, because all of these areas, they were part of the ancient Silk Roads. I would not say Silk Road, the roads. So, but if you, if you fly from uh, Islamabad, so first you go down to Karachi and then move on to somewhere in the Gulf, and then you come to Kyrgyzstan, which makes it you know, look as if it's on Mars, but it's not. So this is a very, I would say, connected area, and um, you can see all these centers. So this shows the connection. And where do we see Hunza today? So again, uh, today you can see that, you know, through the Karakoram Highway, which was constructed by the Chinese investment, um, this area, if you see, this is Hunza. You can see Afghanistan here, Tajikistan, and it runs all the way to Kashgar, and then this is China. So this basically is the uh, location of the area. Uh, and giving a brief back background about the geography of the area, it's basically a mountainous area, but again, it had um, a lot of changes throughout its history. Uh, if we talk about the last 300 years, we see a lot of changes. And uh, people living in Hunza, uh, you have different ethnicities, migrations have taken place, even people from Central Asia, they have gone to Hunza, settled there. For example, if you talk about the uh, Shogni people, Shogni speakers in Tajikistan and uh, in um, Afghanistan today, many of the Shogni people went to Hunza, settled there, adapted the local culture, and now they speak the local languages. And we, we also see that, you know, uh, uh, Kyrgyz population living in China, they went to Hunza, they live there, and now they have forgotten the language. So they have kind of adopted to the local culture. And still, uh, there are in pockets, some Kyrgyz families living in, not in Hunza, but on the bordering districts of Hunza. So the other day I was talking to talk, uh, Dr. Almira and I actually gave her a wrong number. They, they, it's 11 families living. It's not three families, it's 11 families, because there's people living there. But their way of life is also changing. They don't live in yurts anymore there. You know, they, they, they've settled there, they've constructed its own houses. So th this is about the diversity about Hunza makes it special. Th this is what I think. And then in the economy, economy has faced all, it's a, it has also faced a lot of, uh, like a transition has taken place from uh, uh, agro-pastoral economy to uh, agricultural economy. And now it is somewhere between an agricultural economy and small scale farming, and then tourist, tourism related activities going on. So economy has also changed a lot in Hunza. And then why Hunza? why has the importance changed so much? So we'll be also discussing that. But the main question of this um, lecture, I would say is that we will be discussing the last three rulers of Hunza state, Hunza state, which was a tribal state. 
the last three rulers starting from 1892 till 1974. Now, 1974 is the date when Hunza, um, the state was abolished uh, by a prime minister in Pakistan. In 1892 mm. is the date when the British took over in 1891. And in 1892, a new ruler was instated. So the previous ruler went to flew away to China. So after the British invasion, a new ruler was instated, and we'll be discussing we'll be discussing the chronology uh, in this uh, presentation. So this is a very rare picture. The person in the center is uh, Nazim Khan and his son, Ghazan Khan, and this is Jamal Khan. So Nazim Khan was the person who was instated with the support of the Chinese and the British in 1892. And he, Ghazan was the son of Nazim and Jamal was the son of Ghazan. So this is the grandfather, son, and grandson. So this is a very rare picture. And all three of them, they ruled from 1892 to 1974. So you can see the dresses. Uh, you can see the cigarette in his hand, his shoes. It's different. It's not local. So this is how the ruling elite does. You know, the ruling elite, um, they do not dress up as the locals. So, and you can see this uh, robe. This is definitely from the Chinese Turkestan area. So the woolen caps are local. And then you can see this. This is also somewhere from Central Asia. So it's, you can see a lot of, and then you see a tie there with the trousers. So, so this, this basically shows the, that transition was not only uh, in terms of uh, politics. It was also in terms of dressing, in terms of culture and language. So transition was taking place. So again, um, this is the time period. Uh, we see Nazim Khan ruling for this in many years, 46 years, I guess. And then his son ruling for seven years. And then he was being replaced by his eldest son. He, he was actually murdered. Ghazan Khan too was actually murdered. And it is said that you know some people from his family, they were involved in his murder. And then some wazirs, you know, the nobility, people from the nobility. So uh, in this lecture, I'll be discussing the external relations of Hunza, the uh, internal governance, the foster relations. Uh, this is uh, missing, missing from the main discourse. We, whenever we talk about Hunza, we... I mean, the, from, the, from the academia and then, you know, in the general discourse, we don't see that foster relations, the importance of foster relations. Foster relations are those milk relations. Um, when, when a ruler's son is born, eldest son or his children, they are being take, they are taken up by different families for bringing them up and taking care of them, you know? So they are not being brought up in the household. They are given to different families, strong families, so that they, they can take care of them. And this is also a way of uh, uh, trying to save the child's life. Because there are, there, I mean, the literature says that, you know, there, there were reports of uh, many children being killed inside the house. So this was one of the ways. And then I'll also be discussing the incentives uh, which were provided by the ruling elite. Uh, when I say ruling elite, it means the rulers, the ruler, ruler, rulers of uh, Hunza state. And then I'll also be discussing the role of religious institutions that how, you know, an agro-pastoral uh, society, which was practicing religion very traditionally, how that shifted to a very institutionalized way of practicing religion. I'll be also discussing that. And uh, I would add that, you know, in, in Hunza, the, I mean, more than 90% of the population, I would say 95% of the population are Ismaili Muslims, but then you have like uh, 12 like Shia Muslims, and then you have Sunni. So you have these uh, divisions 
the the Muslim divisions, uh, sectarian divisions, I would say. So this picture, uh, it was basically a delegation uh, which was sent to meet the political British political representatives in 1891. And when um, when there was, the, the, I mean, the diplomacy failed. So the Britishers invaded Hunza and then a fight started and then a new ruler was appointed. So uh, I would start with the, uh, the rule of uh, Nazim Khan. So what actually happened was that in 1892, when Nazim Khan took over uh, as the ruler, and locally they call it Mir or Tham. So Tham is mostly uh, referred by the uh, Brushiski speakers, and Mir word is used by the Wahi speakers, Wahi speakers who also live in parts of Central Asia, in Tajikistan, Afghanistan now, in uh, Russia too. So how did the consolidation and the installation of Nazim Khan take place? So what happened was that, you know, when Hunza was invaded uh, by the Britishers, so there was a vacuum because a vacuum happened because Nazim Khan's elder brother was the Mir and then he fled to Chinese Turkestan because his maternal family from his mother's side, he, it was in Chinese Turkestan. So his brother's mother was from China, I mean, Chinese Turkestan. So he fled there. So when Nazim Khan was appointed, the, it was not only uh, a British affair. The Britishers also invited the uh, representatives of the King, King uh, Empire. And the install, installation of Nazim Khan was a joint installation because the Britishers did not want to give a message that, you know, okay, we have installed this. So they also invited the Chinese. And when the Chinese came, the representative, the Chinese came from like parts of Chinese Turkestan, the Britishers asked the Mir not to take gifts from them. So they wanted to embarrass the Chinese, but in a very diplomatic way. So, so this was one of the methods um, employed by the British. Uh, to involve the Chinese, but, you know, to have the upper hand in, in the installation. And then we see that, you know, after Nazim Khan came to power, how the British, they had the upper hand and how they were kind of controlled by the Britishers in a way that they were given jobs in the military. Uh, Hunza scouts, they were introduced. Um, the sons of Nazim Khan, like the eldest son, he was given a rank in the uh, local militia, which was brought up. Uh, and Nazim Khan was actually the one, the ruler. He was, um, he was deciding that, you know, who's physically fit to join the military and who's not. So the Britishers gave this power to the ruler of the state. Uh, whereas if you see in other uh, South Asian examples, like if you see in different princely states in South Asia, like in India, like the United India, you would not see that. I mean, um, you, 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 you will see Britishers coming in, recruiting the local militia, and then, you know, um, not giving a lot of power to the local ruler. And then this uh, employment through the military, it continued. Uh, I would say, till 1974, even when the British left. So this, this continued. And uh, this relation between the rulers of Hunza and the, and, the, and the Britishers, it was a very complex relation. On the one hand, they were uh, spreading out a network of com communication in terms of telephone lines and uh, having uh, telegraph lines, intelligence networks, or then you had these post runners carrying mails on horsebacks to, uh, I would say, Kashgar in uh, Chinese Turkestan. So it was connected. There was a, a political office of the British Council Journal in Kashgar, and then there was a political office, I would say agency, political agency of the Britishers in Gilgit, which was called Gilgit Agency. So they were being connected by, uh, by these uh, networks of communication, as I call them. And these networks of communication were not only benefiting the British. These networks of communication were also benefiting the local rulers 
in a way that they had different uh, appointments in different villages. For example, if there are 10 villages in Hunza, so instead of traveling to every village, uh, the ruler would use the telephone lines to communicate with the uh, village chieftain and inquire about uh, the local problems, uh, the disputes, the resolutions. So it would basically provide the ruler with uh, with a kind of surveillance and then control over the local population through the uh, village chieftains. And this involvement of technology was not only one-sided, it was also benefiting the local rulers and the village chieftains. And there's a very interesting thing, uh, role of annual jalsas. Now, what were annual jalsas? So when the British came in 1891, they introduced this uh, you know, jalsas. Now, jalsas were jalsas were kind of annual gatherings where the local rulers, not only from Hunza, other areas also gathered, and where they had different um, games. They had tug of war. They had horse riding, and this was basically uh, a gathering which showed the power of the British Empire because the political agent invited everyone the local rulers together. And then, you know, they had a kind of feast there, food, polo. It was kind of a social gathering. So this was, uh, this was basically increasing the goodwill of the Britishers in the area with the local ruling elites. So this was a very important point. And then we see that, you know, uh, how when in 1947, in 1947, when Pakistan came into being after the, uh, I, I mean, there was this division of India in 1947. So how was the Pakistani state? How, we, we can see very similar patterns between the Pakistani state and the British empires that how, you know, they benefited the local ruling elites. Because Hunza had already, already written to the founding father of Pakistan that, you know, we accede to Pakistan. But still, it was allowed to be a state till 1974, starting from 1947 till 74. So the local governance was still in the hands of the Mir. Only the foreign policy and the currency, that was in the hands of the state. So if you had some uh, local dispute or some maybe crime happening, so it was the local Council of Elders, which was deciding. It was not the uh, government which was deciding the, uh, I mean, not the government, I mean, the judicial system was very local at that time. And then we see that, you know, different uh, marriages were taking place. Uh, the ru ruling elites, they had different connections with different families. For example, one of the, uh, the uh, um, rulers of Hunza, the tallest one, Nazim, his aunt was married in uh, Badakhshan. And then they had another relation in Chinese Turkestan. And locally they had different, um, I mean, locally marriages took place between different ruling families. And then when, when, when Hunza was being assimilated into Pakistan, so the, the last Mir, he, he gave, I mean, he, his children, they were married into local prominent families in Pakistan. So you can see similar patterns that although the marriages were, you know, not taking place outside the royal bloodline at that time, but then when uh, you, you could see that, you know, Pakistan was there and then you, I mean, Hunza, the political structure, it was the state was, uh, abolished in 1974 and, and you know slowly and gradually uh, the local administration it was being get taken over by the government of pakistan so you could see that the marriages they 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 also played a very important role here so now this is a very uh, interesting part i would say how did the internal governance structure function at that time now the internal governance structure functioned in a very 
complex way. I mean, you cannot just uh, say that Hunzo was ruled by an autocratic ruler. This is one of my main arguments that this was not the case. It was very complex because <clears throat> back then you had the system or hierarchies operating at different levels. At the village level, you either had a Trangpa or an Arbab, who was the village chieftain. And then you had Ilchi. Ilchi is a Turkic word, which means envoy or ambassador. So you can also see these titles. Arbab is somewhere coming from the Persian. And then you have Ilchi coming from Chinese Central Asia. You have another word, Yarpa. Yarpa is a word which has Tibetan roots. So you have these all uh, different, uh, I mean, the, all the titles, they themselves are very different, coming from different languages. <clears throat> so wazirs were basically the ministers who were right, I would say, below the ruler, ruler at that time, and who had a very strong say in different decision-making processes or different conflict resolution uh, at that time. And the role of the wazirs changed in the past. In the past, they were used for fighting, raiding caravans, cattle raiding. They had a lot of fights with Kyrgyz, um, <clears throat> on the, uh, uh, Kyrgyz living on the what you call now the Wakhan Corridor. And then they were uh, Kyrgyz living in Karatang in, um, in uh, Chinese Turkestan. So all these areas, so because Kyrgyz were very, at that time, they had a lot of cattle and, you know, they were going for more grazing areas and these people living here, they also wanted to protect their borders and then, you know, make sure that they have more grazing area because these were all, I would say, mountain societies based on <clears throat> cattle uh, who depended on more pasture land. So the wazirs, had this role. And then when <clears throat> the borders, they were more, uh, I would say, fixed when in 1895, there was this Anglo-Russian agreement and, you know, borders were more sharp and were not more porous. They became less porous with time. So the role of the wazirs also changed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and then, <clears throat> We can see that uh, Ilchis, the role of Ilchis, uh, the Ilchis were ambassadors or they would take uh, tributes from Hunza to other areas. For example, if they had a relation, foreign relation with uh, the Chinese emperor, so they would take annual gold dust, annual um, silver, uh, maybe some rugs, other, you know, things of daily use, some fine horses, which they had uh, captured from some other areas, some fine, maybe yaks. So all this exchange was taking place through the Ilchis at that time. And uh, some of the famous Ilchis were like uh, uh, Nazar Ali Shaw, because he's, he spoke uh, the Turkic language, they call it Kashkari. They, he spoke the uh, Turkic language very well. So he was the Ilchi and then he was a, from a very strong tribe at that time. So he used to, I mean, if you read the British sources, they mention him quite a lot, carrying uh, gold dust and carrying messages and also contacting with the, uh, the British representative who was based in Kashgar on behalf of the ruling Mir. So, and then you had the Arbabs, village Arbabs. Uh, so all these factors, they, you can see that all these appointments, they were, they were very important in the internal governance structure. And all these appointments, uh, you, you can see that in, in the main discourse, nobody discusses all these factors that who was the Ilchi, uh, what did he do? What were their functions? So this was quite a complex th and then under the ilchi uh, under the arbab you had chorbus and then you had uh, uyum was another title uyum uyum means in the local uh, uh, brushiski language it means big or elder uyum uyum is a title and then all these things they 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 basically they show us that you know the internal governance structure it depended on these uh, appointments. And then we can see that, you know, all these foster relations, um, foster relations, they were more closer to the ruling elite. 
because when a person who was brought up in someone's house uh, i mean uh, eldest son of a ruling mir or a thumb so the foster relations had more importance they were given official appointments many of them were made wazirs many were made uh, ilchis arbabs yarpas trangpas so all these titles they went to the foster relations so foster relations had a very important role in the governance structure uh, of hunza state i would say and then you know what did the ruling elite give to these people they gave them titles they gave them jobs in military they um gave them gifts all these things it was a uh, it was it was very um uh, well coordinated i would say that uh it was not only one sided the ruling elite they for their security they went for foster relations security in the sense that maybe they had this thing that you know they might get murdered they their children would not be brought up well and then the foster relations they also benefited from this relation by having appointments and incentives so now i would come to the uh part where a lot of uh, literature is available but the perspective or the narrative which is being presented is uh, i would say is often ignored or overlooked now ismailism in 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 the in hunza uh it it came there in 17th century and it was not through like military generals or it was basically through different messengers and you know they went they came to hunza from central asia they talked about the new faith i mean the new sect and then they wanted people to convert some of the people did some didn't and then you know there are various stories that in 17th century this happened they went back then in 18th century some other a messenger or dai as you say they came and you know they uh, tried to convert people or tell them about the new faith so but this the religious institutions i would say uh they took a more prominent role or it the area was more religiously institutionalized in uh, 20th century especially during the time of aga khan 3 sultan mohammed shah um because he when the british attacked hunza and when the new ruler was instated even before the attack he sent a letter to the ruler that uh, you should not be fighting with the british i mean the uh, the archival or the books or the archives say this that you should not be fighting with the british and uh, and but he did and then he lost his throne so after that the new ruler he coordinated or he had a very good relation with the british the new ruler nazim khan and then that relation continued and then when the new state when pakistan came into being so when the ruler was writing the letter that you know i the ruler of hunza we see to pakistan so the letter was copied to the imam of the time sultan mohammed shah so it was very important it is very important to see that you know uh, the imam of the time although he had a religious role but he was also playing a very political role which is often ignored or which is not discussed and when the last ruler uh, mohammed jamal khan he was the ruler of hunza when the last ruler so when his state was being abolished he was uh, obviously not very happy but again the imam i mean uh, the imam grandson of sultan muhammad shah the current imam of the ismailis um he gave a title or i would say um a position to the ruler and declaring him as the president of the uh, ismailis for central asia now hunza lies in pakistan but making him 
the president of the Swahilis of Central Asia, you know. So this also raises a lot of questions that why Central Asia? And then um, slowly and gradually the ruler of that time, he lost his power. But again, his family, people from his family, they were inducted into different government positions. And uh, some of them are still uh, in different political parties in Pakistan. So this transition from a very uh, different society in 19th century to a society which is moving towards, uh, I mean, assimilating itself into the government machinery in Pakistan. This is a very interesting thing for me. And uh, to understand this, one has to look at a lot of um, different sources. But unfortunately, I would say that, you know, my, uh, my, my, uh, I would say, it's, it's not a very, uh, I mean, I, I regret it that, you know, uh, many of the people who passed away, uh, their records just perished. I mean, they had so many stories to tell and those stories were not recorded. So my case here, the case I make is that, you know, um, oral history, there are still people in Hunza who can, still have a lot of stories to tell. So the three rulers of whom I discussed, Two of them, there are still people who, who, who remember the last two of them. So coming up with a project and covering all the oral stories or, or all the experiences which people went through. So that would be an amazing idea. And my uh, reliance on documents, on the British documents, uh, gazetteers, biographies, magazines, journal articles, newspapers, military documents, and uh, travelogues, books. I mean, all these sources were mostly British sources. And I had some Russian sources, but then, you know, with the Russian sources, you have another issue of translating them and then reading them. So it's, it's a lot of uh, effort and having access to Russian sources is another problem. So the case I make in this paper is that oral history is very important and working writing from a local perspective is only possible when you include oral history, oral experiences, and uh, documentation is the biggest hurdle right now. Documenting and then having relevant people who have um, both interest and then, you know, resources to document all this is very important. And um, Now, coming to the conclusion, um, my, uh, my, I believe that uh, the governance structure of Hunza, as I earlier said that, it, it was not a simple autocratic rule. It was a rule which was uh, uh, relying on the wazirs, the trangfas, the yarpas, the arbobs, the ilchis. And this rule was not without, um, or I would say this rule was not something coming from the top. It was also through the usage of technology, through the usage of telephone lines, through the usage of telegraphs, that the local ruler kept a check on the population. And whenever he felt that you know, he, he needs to change some minister, he would use all these resources at his disposal. And then he would bring changes in the internal governance structure of the state. And then there was this concept of mobile court. So the mobile court was that the court would move in summers. In summers, the court would move to different areas, to different pastures. And then in winters, it would move to different areas where it's more comfortable, where, where you have more meat, where you have, you have more uh, food. So the court would move and it would decide different, uh, I mean, con uh, issues of conflict. It would have different advisors or different ministers for different areas. So all the mobile court was a very, uh, I would say, I would say it's, it was a very efficient way of administering the area. 
and then through the different appointments in the local uh, in the military i would say paramilitary the ruler ensured that the children of the uh, nobility or i would say the children of the elders different uh, from different strong tribes of the area they get employment and then they also get stipends now these stipends were given by the british government but it was the ruler of funza who decided who would receive these stipends so the, it was a whole web of a very complex web and i would say that the ruler of funza was not a sovereign deciding everything it was also coming from down from the ministers and the britishers knew this very well and we we, we I, I also discussed that you know uh, the whole society in the area it moved from a traditional very traditional society and in, uh, traditional in the sense of practicing religion it was not very rigid and now it's moving towards a more institutionalized way of practicing religion uh, where you have different structures operating um, and uh, you know all these things are leading towards uh, a more organized way of practicing religion and then we can see that you know the ra last ruler who was a very uh, i would say very politically active and a very shrewd man he actually had both these things he was uh, politically aware that you know his state was going down it was 1974 his state was dissolved but then again you know he asked for some benefits from the state of pakistan and because of that his children they um, had government appointments they had different jobs and then he also um, made sure that some of his children they get married into the prominent political families of pakistan so the internal governance structure changes from a very traditional setup to a setup where now hunza is just a district it's just a district where uh, where a local government official is in charge so we need to analyze and even from 1974 i mean my area is uh, my time period is from 1892 to 1974 from 1974 up till now there have been a lot of changes in the area so one can also work on that and then <clears throat> i make a case here for the oral story again that you know for the oral history that the last two mirs of funza many people still remember him uh, them and there are many stories which the locals share in the area they share and these need to be documented so um, that's all for from my side any questions would be happy to answer. Uh, which one? Should I read all of them? It's kind of... Good efforts by Bashara. Thanks for your insight on some key areas like fostering marriages and colonial past and diaspora. I wonder if you can also share if you have not have done primary research and hope you have also reviewed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what published uh, by Simon Kreisman, Safar Akbar, and the oral stories collected by professional mind by local researchers. Land development, revenue collection, and geopolitics play a key role in internal governance. Thank you for your comment and for your questions. So I hope I should have the last yes. Yeah. Uh, can I have that? Yes. Uh, the, that's a very relevant question. And uh, I would say that uh, the uh, recent work of Herman uh, Krutzman, it is a very, uh, I would say, important work, but he misses out on many things. Uh, he he has a perspective because he comes from a background where that you know he it's more about geopolitics and then you know he's a geographer 
uh, he's done a lot of work and in his last book hunza matters he he talks about all these things but he talks about it in a very scattered way he does not discuss i mean by naming different tribes in the area the foster relations uh, why were the foster relations important and why were were those children being brought up in certain families and why were certain families chosen to be the foster relations for a very long time for example there's a tribe in one of the villages in hunza it's it's called uh, it's a it's called budul tribe so in budul tribe many of the uh, children of the ruling family they were brought up in this tribe so he does not discuss in detail that why was this particular tribe being chosen and then he misses on some of the um, some of the other um, i would say because dr herman relied a lot on the archives as i did so he also discusses a lot about the details which were given in the archives in the british archives so he discusses some families then he misses on some else so again dr herman so i would say that um, this is something uh, i believe uh, he could have like written more about and then uh, dr herman uh, he i believe has included some of the uh, prominent personalities of, in the of the area in his book with pictures and other details but he has missed on some of the uh, personalities of the area who were very important personality for for example um, i would say ilchi nazar ali show ilchi nazar ali show was very important and then you have another example of uh, yarpa himayat show so he also missed on them and then you have another example of yarpa mohammed nido he was also very important because he stayed uh, an arbab uh, yarpa for 19 years and then he became an arbab and then he also missed on um, um mirza sarang mohammed who was another very important he was the secretary of state of hunza so he does, does not discuss a lot about these personalities so i would say that uh, these are some and zafar iqbal the problem with zafar iqbal's work is that um, i i believe that you know uh, reading something and then understanding it and then writing about it and then creating a perspective so zafar iqbal's work misses on perspective um, i think it's some things from here some from there and then you pile it up then you write it type it and then get it published so i think it's more of uh, what uh, zafar iqbal does is it's it's uh, hard to digest i mean it's too much and then you know the perspective is missing so you don't have a argument going on in his work this is the problem uh, with the zafar iqbal's work again you know the oral stories collected by published online by local researcher yes a, a very uh, important um, uh, oral stories i came across was um, fazlamin beg i mean his his work uh, he's he's doing it online now he's he's done a lot of work he's based, i think he studied um, he studied persian and then he studied cultural studies so he's publishing his line a lot he he has his website and then he's coming up with articles and oral stories and now he also has a vlog on youtube so i i i took into account some of uh, uh, fazlamin beg's work and uh, yes so that's for this comment do we have someone else yeah thank you so much Yes. I would like to add that you know Dr. Herman uh, Krutzman. He was the one who uh, helped me in uh, with the some of the Russian sources, and then he provided with with me uh, provided me with the translations of the resources. So I'm very thankful to Dr. Herman for his uh, contribution into my work. Yeah. 
that's not there is another perforating tab muscle setting please turn on your microphone and ask your question Hello. Yes, am I am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Oh uh, yeah, this is Mansoor from Hunza. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Basharat has mentioned that Mir uh, Ghadan Khan was murdered, and he mentioned that uh, some family members were involved and some wazirs or uh, family members of the wazirs were involved mm -hmm. in the murder. In uh, that murder. Can you please um, explain it more who was behind this murder? Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I uh, was actually talking about uh, Jamal Khan's father, Ghazan Khan II, Muhammad Ghazan Khan II, who got murdered in 1945 when he was in the, uh, what do you say, Winter Palace in Gulmet. And one of the perspective is that, you know, he was um, kicked. I mean, he was highly drunk and he was kicked from the rooftop. And then because of that, he had a head injury and he died two days later. This is one of the perspectives. Uh, locals remember this, but, and there is another perspective which says that, uh, which is from the archives, which is from the Indian archives. It says that uh, the ruler was murdered because he had murdered, the ruler had murdered in 1934, he had murdered the brother of the wazir because the brother of the wazir had said something, I would say, immoral about his family or accused his family of something. So the, the Indian archives say this, you know, because of that, the ruler, the uh, ruler had him murdered in 1934 and then he himself was murdered in 1945. So 11 years. So th these are the two perspectives, yeah. Uh, we have another question. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. It was very interesting and, and well delivered. Um, I basically have two questions. Yes. Um, the first one uh, concerns local sources. Um, I fully agree that local history is needed, uh, but I also wonder whether you can tell us a little more about written sources that are available. Like I think of the historical work of Kudrat Ulubek, for instance, that, yeah. that has not been really explored in depth in, in historical writing. Um, the Kud second- Kudrat Ulubek. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The second um, question concerns um, the role of partition and the ensuing Kashmir conflict, because I think it's something you haven't really talked about, but for the consolidation of political power, it must have been uh, tremendously important as well. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that as well. Thank you. All right. Uh, for the first part, uh, you're talking about Kudratullah Beg. So many of the historians, they've relied a lot on Kudratullah Beg's sources, but the problem with Kudratullah Beg's sources is that he comes from a from a very like prominent family of the area. And he tries to hide many things like the murder of his relative. I mean, the person who I'm talking about, Imam Yarbek. So he's, he's kind of related to Kudrutullah Beg and he basically does not talk about this murder. He does not talk about the murder. Why was the ruler murdered? Why was this person murdered? What were the reasons behind this? So he kind of picks and chooses. So that's the problem. And then Kudrutullah Beg and then Kudrutullah Beg, another problem with him, uh, was that he just traveled uh, because he traveled through the Hunza and then, you know, he was collecting different um, articles or different pieces, old pieces of Persian, Arabic and something. And then one day he comes up with the book. So he's, he was not a historian, I would say. Not historian in the sense that he did not carry out a proper research. His work was published in maybe 60s, 70s or 80s. I mean, I, there are different 2006. I, I've, the one with the copy which I have, it's in, from 2006. So this, this is his problem. And then if you if you talk about the Kashmir issue, right? You're talking about the Kashmir issue. The Kashmir issue, um, I mean, Hunza was one of the states which was uh, ruled by 
I mean, through Kashmir, but the political agent was based in Gilgit. So it was a very complex relation. And then um, I, I would say that I've, I've focused more on the internal governance. And then I, I've, I mean, intentionally not touched upon the, uh, uh, upon the Kashmir issue because Kashmir issue has a lot of like uh, legal points to it, like constitutional things. And then uh, if when you talk about the accession of uh, Hunza state to uh, Pakistan, uh, the accession did not take place actually. It's missing. The accession isn't there because the ruler said that, you know, we accede to Pakistan, so you accept us. But Hunza was not given a status of, um, uh, I mean, the whole area was not given a status of a province and it was attached to the Kashmir issue so that in case if you have a plebiscite in, in the future, so you have more votes for the plebiscite. So it was kind of um, uh, sacrificing Hunza or the whole Gilgit Baltistan region just for the case of uh, Kashmir. This, this is an issue. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, thank you again for these um, really insightful views. Um, with regard to Kudrat Ulubek, I, I would really argue, though, that it's hard to find more kind of historical insights into, for instance, how religious institutions came into the region, um, let's say, from the 1930s onwards. So I, I think it's quite important historical material, not as a historian per se. I mean, you yeah. didn't have any trained historians in that region then, but uh, simply as a historical document to analyze and to understand what the dynamics were of pulling um, specific kinds of religious institutions into the area. And with regard to uh, the Kashmir conflict, I completely agree. That's exactly the kind of answer I was kind of hoping for. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, my name is Tilma Stoblanski. I'm a professor of anthropology in uh, Geneva. So I've done research in, in Central Asia as well as in Hunza and other places in Pakistan. Uh, yes, please. Are you Tim? Yes. I know you. <laughs> I've read your work. So uh, Kudratullah Beg's work is very important in terms of, uh, I mean, when he describes the local religious institutions, because he himself was part of the local religious institutions, and then starting from um, his ancestors, one of uh, Raza Beg, Muhammad Raza Beg, he was also instructed by Aga Khan III to, uh, to open these institutions and then run them, you know. So Qudratullah Beg's family played a very important role in the institutionalization of the area. But again, my point is that, you know, the uh, perspective of Qudratullah Beg, it's, it's a very, it's a perspective which, I mean, he misses on many things. He just overlooks some important personalities of the area who also played a very important role in the internal governance structure. He just picks and chooses whatever suits him. I mean, this is how I see it. So the importance of oral history, that is why I'm saying that there are still people who are alive who can give you maybe more insights than Kudratullah Beg might have given. Or, yeah, yeah, much larger part. So maybe uh, going for a project which has more detail and then, you know, it, it might come, it might be some, uh, a, a completely different perspective than Kudratullah Beg's work. So, I mean, that is why I'm focusing a lot on oral history. I mean, documenting oral history. Um, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions? If not, may I ask, um, you talked about the um, uh, different tribal groups, um, uh, the, how the society was organized. So I see some similarities between Central Asian societies during the you know, uh, Tsarist uh, empire, how they came and divided the territories of Central Asia into different administrative divisions like Oblast, Volos, Uyezd. So similar things I think took place uh, in, in this uh, region by the British uh, empire, yeah. right? So how was traditionally the society uh, organized and what kind of major tribal groups like, uh, do you have like major, for example, among the Kyrgyz, we have three major tribal groups and under those tribal groups, we have different clans right and during the tsarist empire also uh, they uh, ruled the region through these traditional uh, tribal um, leaders elite 
Mm -hmm. So one-ups, buys, they played nice. an important role. So I see some similarity here. So can you please tell more about the traditional tribal structure and which, who were the main tribal uh, groups? Um, and then you mentioned that um, foster families. So when they gave their children, the, the children of the elites, yeah, the ruling class, so they selected certain uh, families. So were there like particular tribal group that had more like power or respect in the society? And who were these uh, uh, tribal groups? Very interesting questions. Um, you're right that, you know, you had these different titles like bears, ataliks, I think also you had these ataliks. So, so there's, there's an area in Pakistan, it's called Chatral. They still have these titles of ataliks. I mean, they consider themselves, I mean, whenever they refer to them, their family, they said, we come from the family of ataliks. So they also have these. So basically uh, the area was, linguistically, ethnically very diverse. And then, you know, you had tribes coming in from China, Badakhshan, some people coming from like mainland Pakistan, some Pashtuns coming in, uh, not to Hunza, but to different areas in the whole region. In Hunza, you have uh, different linguistic ethnic groups, but when they came here, they got assimilated into different tribes, I would say. And the concept of tribe also uh, varies. I mean, there are some tribes who came later. They have, they have a very strong concept of tribe, tribe. And then some of the tribes they migrated to different areas. They lost contact with the language. They adopt, new, adopted new languages. So those, those, those on those lines, if we see, uh, they, they, they lost this concept of, you know, the larger tribe, as you say that, you know, in Kyrgyz uh, community, you have this four, four, three, three major tribes. So we don't have like three major because it's different uh, people speaking different languages. So they have different concept of tribe and assimilation is also going on still now. So it's not as strong, I would say, as the Kyrgyz people had or have uh, right now. So, yeah. And then you talked about the foster families. Uh, there were certain foster families uh, uh, who had been, you know, uh, taking, a, taking away the, ch ch the children of the ruling family and then taking care of them. And those tribes were, I, I believe that those tribes were in those areas where you had major pasture area or where, where the, the area which was more abundant in food, more abundant in meat, in milk products, in wool, uh, you had more animals there. So there was this more chance of survival. You see, I mean, the ch uh, child, mostly the male child, the female ch children were also given away for foster relations. So there was more, uh, where there was more abundance of food, there was more comfort, they were given to those and uh, to those tribes and those regions. And in those regions, they had like the tribe was the number of household they had. The number of households and those, if they, have, if you have a big tribe, so which means that you know you have more labor, you can do more. Um, uh, uh, you can go to the pastures with the whole tribe, and then come come with more food, produce more. So you have more influence in the area. This is how I see it. So I believe that uh, uh, the, these were the reasons for the uh, selection of the different tribes. And just one last question. You said uh, the last uh, Han, yeah? Han, yeah. Um, after 1974, yeah. uh, his uh, family got married into families, elite families in Pakistan, you said. Political So family. did religion play a role in here or not? Uh, religion uh, did not play a role in here. Yeah. So because those families, they were, although they were Muslims, but you know, they, they were from a different sect. So, so, I mean, it was more kind of a very pragmatic, I would say, on their part, getting your, I mean, establishing relations with families in Pakistan, prominent families, political families. So, yeah, religion uh, was not an issue. Uh, participants, among our participants, do we have any questions? So if there are no questions, I think uh, we need to 
uh, conclude now. Well, thank you very much again, Mohammed, for this very uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, I personally learned uh, a lot. I knew very little about uh, this northern, so-called northern areas of Pakistan, Gilgit, Baltistan, because in Central Asia we have very little information about our, you know, neighboring uh, countries. And uh, I'm sure that during our discussions we learned that we share a lot in terms of our culture, some of the languages, values. So I think. Um, this kind of um, uh, sharing uh, research findings, uh, uh, discussing some of the similarities yeah, between these mountain communities, regions is very important, I think, for the younger generation also. And so we wish you best of luck in your uh, future research. And uh, I hope, I think, um, your research findings will fill in some of the missing gaps in uh, research and literature uh, in the history of this region. Thank you very much again for sharing your research. Thank you so much. I would just like to say that uh, thank you, Dr. Amira and your whole unit for uh, having me. Uh, and I'm just a student and a like learner. So uh, thank you for giving me this uh, an opportunity. And it's an honor to be here at University of Central Asia. Thank you so much. Thank you.